Hi, I'm Mike from Hackaday, and I'm here with Sammy Kamkar at the 2016 Hackaday Super Conference. I was at your talk, it was awesome. fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've learned so much from you all, from the Hackaday community. I'm, I'm traditionally a software person, and uh, I keep seeing people do such cool stuff with hardware, and I've always been so jealous. Um, I still am. I love, uh, so I see so many cool projects on Hackaday. Um, and have learned a ton, so I'm here to share some cool stuff. How did you come up with the topic for it? Um, the topic, I guess it was just uh, stuff I was interested in combined with uh, kind of the community here, like the hardware stuff, mm -hmm. right? Building hardware, and I wanted to show sort of the hacks that I like in the hardware arena and RF, and also how the tools I use are, are the simple things. They're the basic things that I think everyone kind of gets started on, mm -hmm. um, like Arduino, and I still use that for, you know, things that I think people might assume are advanced attacks. I still pull out an Arduino Nano and I use that as much as I can to execute and pull off some of these things. Yeah, I really liked it. It seemed like the message was your toolbox isn't just those trinkets, but it's the knowledge of how to use them and especially how to quickly get what you need from those tools. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want, like, I think it's so cool that I can use these tools and it's in really cool capacity. And I think a lot of people make assumptions that, yeah, you can make lights blink, but that's it. And I think lights blinking by itself is awesome, but you can do so much more. And if you also, if you just look and you try to understand how other people design something or develop something, you can also get around that. You can manipulate it. You can use it in really cool ways that wasn't necessarily intended to be used. So you mentioned um, that you had uh, done a one square inch board um, challenge yeah. where you built a um, wireless uh, link with a microcontroller that um, runs the Arduino, uses the Arduino Correct. IDE. So you don't have a background in um, like board layout and, no. and circuit design. How that, did you get to the point where that. you could use the tools and then design the tools? Um, that was my first board, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> um, which was funny because I didn't know anything. I mean, really, it was just going on kind of like the SparkFun and Adafruit kind of Eagle, like learn how to use Eagle. In fact, I first used KiCad because I tried to do open source whenever I can. Uh, but the mouse movement was really weird at the time, finicky for me, so I just switched. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll just uh, I'll start with Eagle. And I saw Hackaday had a square, uh, a one-inch square board challenge. I was like, oh, that's a really cool challenge. Uh, unfortunately, it, was, it had just finished. I was like, well, <laughs> it would be it would be cool thing to. It it seems like a cool thing because you can kind of use any amount of space you want. But I, I like when there are constraints involved. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a really cool constraint. And while there are existing sub gigahertz transceivers out there, it'd be cool to use it with Arduino because there is no Arduino based. Um, sub gigahertz transceiver out there. So I just wanted to create something that had those constraints and that, that seemed like a really cool thing. So people who are into Arduino can start messing with radio frequency because RF is all around us. It's our car, our garage, um, even you know credit cards. You can use RF to actually produce that magnetic field. That's so, so cool. So I think this is your first year at the Supercon? Yeah. What do you think? What, how's your experience been so far? Oh, this is awesome. I mean, so many, I was really excited when I saw a lot of the names um, on the list of talks, right? Like Ben Krasno and Ken Sheriff and Sprites and Todd. Um, yeah, so, and I've seen some of the talks and they're awesome. So it's pretty cool and really cool to be around so many people who are like-minded and are making awesome stuff. Like it's one of the coolest badges I've ever seen. Um, I go to DEF CON a lot and they always have cool badges too, but like these are, it's not, I don't get that kind of badge anywhere else. So it's nice to see in my home in Los Angeles. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, you know, the last question I have is kind of a weird one. So yeah. why does the Supercon matter? Why does Supercon matter? Um, I don't know. For, for It matters to me because I think it's, uh, I get to hang out with like-minded people and get to share what I think is interesting and important. And um, for me, I guess when I was younger, uh, everything that I learned from the basically the internet community of like open source um, and I started from the software side, but on the software side for me, I learned, I, I don't have a high school diploma. I learned from the internet and from what people put out there. And I've learned so much from Hackaday and that stuff like helped me when I needed a job. When I was like 16 years old, I dropped out and I needed a job to pay rent. Um, it was because of all the stuff I learned online. And it's important to me because now I know there are other people who are, if one person can be helped by that same situation, where they're like, oh, I went to the Supercon, or I read Hackaday, or I read open source projects online, and I learned how to do something, and then they get a job from that that helps them in life, I think that's like super powerful. Yeah, I think that's really great. And you know, it brings up something I wanted to talk about a little bit, it's been on my mind. So you're obviously, um, you know, like autodidactic, you teach yourself a lot of the skills that you have. And um, you know, looking at the time period that we grew up in learning technology, 
there weren't kind of as many um, like laws and rules being held over our heads. And, and I felt um, at the time like I was very free to experiment and, and take things apart and put them back together. Um, do you think it's changed now? Like uh, obviously the, the big one is the DMCA has a lot of prohibitions from people hacking on phones and equipment and stuff. Is it different now for you know middle schoolers and teenagers who are learning technology than it was when we were that age? Um, yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I think there's definitely things to be more worried about now. Right, because the DMCA now you're kind of you have to be you can't necessarily take copyrighted work and show it, even though it's something you purchased. You may have bought a car and then um, you don't actually own that car, you can't necessarily always extract the firmware mm -hmm. and then release that publicly, even though you kind of you're not saying you made it, you're just you're showing what you got. Uh, you can't show the source code, you can't release that. That's copyrighted work that you're not allowed to release publicly, even though you can use it. Um, so there's some scary things there. Uh, if you want to, you know, there have been some car companies who have been trying to prevent people from actually modifying the car that they purchased. Um, fortunately, that never uh, never came to fruition. Um, the Copyright Office did not allow, did not prevent. Basically, now we are allowed in America to modify or to tinker with our own vehicles and mm -hmm. the things that we purchase. So that, that ruling just started, I believe, a week ago or so. So I'm pretty happy about that. But um, yeah, I think it is, it, it is disconcerting because some, I think as a kid, you might not know that this port scan can get you in trouble or, right. you know, uh, where's the line? And it's a complex thing or it's a complex thing to know about. Yeah. But I think more and more we definitely are seeing some people get in trouble. So do you think, um, again, especially for this younger generation who's, you know, having the chance to first tinker and learn these things, is there value in, you know, being allowed to do that as long as you exercise like responsible disclosure? Yeah, I, I think what should happen is people should, uh, I think, young. Know, I think kids should be taught this is how to actually behave responsibly in this arena of hacking and security and um, exploitation and learning and research, right? Some of the stuff you're just trying to learn something, but you might be breaking a rule or law by doing it. You don't necessarily know that, or it's not obvious why, why it's important not to do it or to do it the right way. So I think I get emails from people who are kids who did something at their school, like they broke into a server in their school, and they're just like messing around. They're not trying to be malicious in any way, and the cops come, right? And they are now facing, you know, they're facing charges. And I get like literally parents and kids who email me, and immediately everything's like, the book is thrown at them. It's like, mm -hmm. well, teach them, right? You have to <laughs> teach them, say, this is wrong. However, we can use your skills for good. And I think if you ask most people, do you want to use these skills for good? Can You can help the, your community? People would say yes. Uh, but I think often we just don't even have that opportunity. Um, at that time, so. So do you have any suggestions, like let's say someone comes and says, I wanna learn how to dump and reverse engineer firmware, mm -hmm. or I wanna learn how to do lo a logic analyzer on something, or I wanna learn cross-site scripting. Do you have places you send people that's like a responsible way to learn this stuff? Um, uh, that's a good question. I guess uh, if it's like, yeah, cross-site scripting or web people, I tell them OWASP. Um, if it's uh, firmware stuff, I can tell them Hackaday. Um, so I definitely have a couple things uh, of point. You know, certain people I also like really like, like uh, Joe Grant or Joe Fitz, uh, uh, Fitzpatrick. They, they do really cool stuff and they're good people, right? Um, so I think just by seeing people speak um, and kind of, uh, you know, I learned by emulating people I, I really respected and like the, the, who did really cool projects. And a lot of those people are really good people and they, they don't, they're not, not malicious, even though they're creating awesome like exploitation tools. Um, so I think meeting those people and seeing how they behave was a really good learning experience for me. Like, oh yeah, I wanna be like that. Like, I, wanna, I wanna be a good person too. I wanna make things that other people can use and I can share with people. Um, so yeah, I think it's really just sharing people, sending them to the right people, to the right sources, so they can see that, you know, the good side. Um, so you mentioned like Joe Grand, and that makes me think of like Loft and that Hacker mm -hmm. Collective. Um, yeah. And you know, yourself, other people, everyone's kind of grown up and like went off and got a job, which is how <laughs> life works. But it makes me wonder, like, are there other groups out there that are like Loft that have that kind of, you know, close knit community that's learning and sharing ideas? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Well, you know, it's been great talking to you today. Thank yeah, you so thanks. much for your time. I really appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thanks so much.